So we've talked now about the protostomes that belong to the Lophotrochozoan category. We'll look now at the ectozoans who are part of the protostomes. So I want to remind you that this division into the Lophotrochozoans and the ectozoans was originally established using molecular data and then aligned to um, physical characteristics later on. And so for the ectozoans, there's two phyla, nematodes and arthropods, that belong to this category. And they're defined by the trait of molting. And the technical name for that is ectosis, or we can also call that shedding. Um, so all ectozoans possess an, an outer coating called either a cuticle or an exoskeleton that provides support to their body, which is soft on the inside of that cuticle or exoskeleton, as well as protection of that soft body. Because of that outer coating, in order to get bigger um, or to change in their shape, so their developmental stages, they have to shed that outer coating because that outer coating is rigid, right? So to get bigger, they have to lose that outer coating. So um, these developmental stages where they shed or molt um, are part of what's called metamorphosis, and we'll see that in more detail. So we'll briefly look at phylum nematoda. Phylum nematoda has the common name of roundworm. Um, so a lot of worms that we talk about. So these are the roundworms. We've also talked about flatworms and segmented worms. Roundworms in phylum nematoda are often microscopic. So this is a roundworm here. This is a microscopic image. So you would not be able to see this in the naked eye, with your naked eye. Um, they exist in virtually all habitats. Many of them are soil dwelling decomposers. So they're present in the soil. You just can't see them. Um, probably the, one of the most well-known nematodes is called C. elegans. Um, because it's a model organism in a lot of laboratory research. And it was actually isolated from a compost pile in England. So again, emphasizing this role as soil dwelling decomposers. There's over 20,000 species known today, though people suspect that there are a lot more because it's hard to identify them in soil. Um, they have a tough cuticle that on the outside of their body that's made out of collagen. So it's a thickened collagen, which is also within your skin, but this is in a, in a sort of tougher form. And it's that cuticle that has to be um, shed or molted uh, in order for it to grow. Um, and working with that cuticle, it has a hydrostatic skeleton to allow for movement. Um, while most nematodes are beneficial soil dwelling decomposers, there are some well-known parasitic examples. Um, these are all human parasites, so there are also nematode parasites in plants. Um, so there are diseases that plants get from nematodes, um, and other vertebrates also get some nematode infections. Ascaris is a huge one in um, other places, not here in the United States, but worldwide there's over 1 billion people infected. Um, hookworm and pinworm are also nematode infections. These are less severe um, uh, intestinal parasites um, or body parasites. And actually a fair amount of people in the United States probably have, are infected with these at least during childhood. So some people estimate that probably at least 30% of Americans at any given time are carrying these parasites. Um, as long as people have adequate nutrition, um, these do not appear to manifest any symptoms. So they're sharing food with you. Um, and as long as you have enough food, that's not really an issue, um, which is why so many people probably in the United States are carrying these without knowing it. Uh, and then um, another one, uh, Mucheria, causes a disease called elephantiasis. Um, and this one attacks the lymph nodes. So it, it um, infects uh, affected people and travels to the lymph nodes and it can damage the lymph nodes. And so what happens is, especially in limbs, where the lymph nodes get damaged, they're not able to adequately drain fluid from the limbs. And so you get ab really severe abnormal swelling. And so this is um, this uh, person's normal foot, and this is their leg that is being affected by elephantiasis. So again, the fluid is not able to move out of that limb anymore because the nematode has damaged the lymph system um, in that limb. 
So interestingly, I, I highlighted just now severe consequences um, or disease-causing parasites, um, but one of the things that has surprised researchers is to realize that at least in some cases, um, parasite load can be good for us. Um, so this includes flatworms, nematode parasites, and it also probably is significant with um, bacteria and fungi as well. Um, so flatworm and nematode parasites in particular are now being studied as treatments for asthma, allergies, and other inflammatory and autoimmune disorders. So all of these things are um, abnormalities in immune function or tied to abnormalities in, in immune function. Um, and so um, why the parasites seem to help with these things is really a, a hot topic in biology. Um, and so there's a, a couple of ideas circulating. One is called the hygiene hypothesis. Um, which says that, you know, being too clean is bad for you, um, basically. Um, and there's a lot of data that supports this. For example, um, children raised in uh, rural settings um, where presumably they're exposed to more like dust and dirt and all that kind of, and animals and stuff like that, um, have less asthma and allergies than kids in the city. Um, also, similarly, people um, in developed nations um, have way more allergies and asthma than people in developing nations. Um, and so again, presumably in developing nations, people are exposed um, to more dirt and dust and animals and things like that than in, um, in our developed nations. And so that has all led researchers to suspect that a certain amount of normal exposure to parasites, to dust, to germs, um, is normal and how our immune system gets trained. That really our immune system um, learns at a very early age and they actually think, um, you know, even zero to one is this critical time period, but it continues throughout your life. Um, that your immune system becomes trained to really distinguish between really, really bad things and things that are normal and okay for you to get exposed to and to adjust its response. And so that's how you would, for example, not have an allergic reaction because your body learned that, okay, this thing is okay, this thing is bad. Um, and so there's a growing body of evidence that parasites somehow play a role in helping our immune system um, moderate its response and to have the appropriate response to things. Um, and so um, that's where parasites are coming in later in life is, as a way to maybe retrain the, the um, for example, the digestive system, the intestines to moderate their immune response so that they're not causing the symptoms of Crohn's disease. So that's an area of active research right now, really exciting research. All right, so phylum arthropoda. Um, so this is a huge phylum. It's also part of the ectozoans, part of the protostomes. Um, some people describe this as the most successful phylum. And that's because if you look at uh, the living species on earth today, about 75% of them belong to phylum arthropoda. So they have really flourished on earth. Um, and so why did they do so well? Why are so many animals arthropods? They have a really adaptable body plan. Um, so they have segmentation um, and the way that that has allowed them to modify their appendages, for example, um, their mouth parts, locomotion, has allowed them to really find ways to be successful in all kinds of biomes. And so you find them flying in the air, you find them in the dirt, um, you find them um, in the ocean, in fresh water, you find them eating all kinds of different food sources. So they really have been able to find needs everywhere. So let's take a look at that body plan. This is an example arthropod. This is a grasshopper. Um, so they have a hard exoskeleton that's uh, made of a mixture of chitin and protein. And depending on the organism, it can be very rigid or it can be just a little bit rigid. So um, a grasshopper has a pretty rigid one. If you've ever stepped on one, there's a distinct crunch. Um, even more rigid and thick than that is something like a crab or a lobster. Um, now compare that to say an ant. An ant also has an exoskeleton, but its body is much softer than a grasshopper. So again, just depends on the organism. 
um, the exoskeleton is relatively impermeable to water. So water is not going out of their body. So that's helping to hold water in their body so they don't dry out. Um, so they don't have to be like a worm always hanging out in most soil, um, moist soil, um, because they can hold moisture in there. Now, on the other hand, um, that rigid shell inhibits gas exchange that they might want to do. So they're holding in water vapor, but they need to move oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so you see that they have to have a more complex um, respiratory system. So um, this depends on the type of arthropod, but they have either gills or a tracheal system with spiracles or book lungs um, that help do this gas exchange for them. Um, so they have segmented bodies, and this isn't like you don't see like the lines like you do in a worm, but we see these three segments, head, thorax, and abdomen um, in, in arthropods. Um, and then coming off of those segments um, are specialized appendages that have joints. So I'm going to underline this, jointed appendages. And these jointed appendages are super useful for them. They help them move. And so they're extremely modified in different organisms for movement. Um, they're important for food handling. So many of them will use these appendages to hold food and they'll often use them for reproduction as well. Um, so a lot of function coming from these appendages. I've mentioned the body segments. These are the tagmata, the different, the different um, body segments. They have extensive cephalization. So located in their head, they have well-developed organs for sight smell, hearing. Um, they also have good sense of touch and balance. Um, and so, you know, think about like if you wanted to step on a grasshopper, they can sense you coming and jump away. So it's actually really hard to do. Um, or think about swatting a fly. Again, same thing. They're very aware. They're complex. They have complex processing of all of these senses um, and are able to avoid you. Um, their eyes are special compound eyes, so they see very differently from us. They're called omatidia. Um, and so they see like, maybe you've seen it, uh, this image before, they sh kind of see multiple um, of everything. Instead of seeing one thing, they see it repeated multiple times. And so they have to have a sophisticated brain to interpret all this sensory input. Um, and that's how it's so hard to catch them, right? Because they are put inputting all this stuff um, to avoid you. So we'll take a look, a tour of some of the arthropods. You're probably familiar with most of, most of these. So this is Chelicerata. Um, the most iconic example of this is the spiders. Um, it also includes, however, scorpions, ticks, and mites. Um, they're different from the grasshopper because two of their um, tagmata are fused. So they have the cephalothorax, which is the head and thorax fused. So they really just have two major body parts. So here's one, that's the cephalothorax, and here's the abdomen. You probably know this is a black widow. This is what the female black widow looks like. The male looks very different. And this is a mature one. Um, she's very large. Um, they can be smaller than this when they're younger. Um, they have four pairs of walking legs or eight legs total. So we can count them there um, on the black widow. Um, and they also have a, a modified appendages up front for handling their food. So they actually use that to grab onto their food. Um, the myripoda are our millipedes and centipedes. Um, so the difference between a millipede and centipede is the amount of legs. So the, the, the word milla means a thousand and centa means a hundred, um, they don't really have a hundred and a thousand legs, but it does reflect a difference in amount of legs. Centipedes have one pair of legs per segment. So see how the legs occur individually on this centipede. And centipedes are usually carnivorous. They eat like other bugs, for example. Um, the millipedes, on the other hand, have more legs. So again, not necessarily a thousand, but more of them. So notice that on this millipede, there is two legs per segment. So way more legs. Um, they can have way more legs because of this occurring in pairs on their segments. And these guys are herbivorous, so they're usually eating plant matter um, or even like decomposing plant matter, which is why you'll sometimes find them like, for example, underneath a plant pot or something. Okay, the crustaceans, subphylum crustacea includes your a lot of your water-dwelling arthropods, crabs, lobsters, barnacles, crawfish, shrimp, 
Um, so again, a lot of water dwelling ones, some are also on land, um, at least part time. Um, they have some unique features. So they have two pairs of antennae on their heads. Um, but even more significant is like the swimmerettes. So back here, so these are walking legs like other arthropods have, but they usually have these walk, these swimmerettes on the back of their body, um, on their abdomen that helps them swim. So they can walk and swim. Um, and then on their head, they have a large um, sort of extended uh, exoskeleton um, or cuticle that goes over their whole head. So just their eyes are out. Um, so this helps protect their, their, their um, head region um, more than uh, some other arthropods get. Um, so just their little eyes are sticking out. Okay, the biggest group of arthropods is hexapoda. These are your true insects. Um, and so this is, when, when we say that arthropods are this huge amount of, of animals on earth, it's really the hexapods. There are more species of insects than all other animal species combined. Um, again, this, their body plan has made them really, really successful. Um, in particular, they adapted wings. And their wings, while they're the same name as a bird's wing or a bat's wing, they're actually very different. Instead of being modified limbs, so they are not limb replacements, they actually grow out of the body wall. So um, think of, for a bird, like think about its wings. It has wings instead of arms. Okay, so that's what I mean about limb replacement. Birds evolved wings instead of having arms. Bats evolved wings instead of having arms. Um, for insects, they keep all of their appendages. They get wings too, okay? So they didn't have to give up their arms. So they will have a set of arms and legs, and they will have wings. Um, so that's kind of a nice benefit. And again, the reason why is because um, they actually grow it out of their body. So it would be like if I grew wings out of my back. OK, I would still have my arms, but I, I would have wings behind me as well. There are a lot of different hexapod orders and we're not going to name all of them. Um, they differ in their wing parts, in their wings and their mouth parts. So just to give you a taste of some of the differences in arthropods, we can see the mouth parts of several here. So grasshoppers have mouth parts adapted for chewing. They chew leaves. Um, mosquitoes are blood suckers, so they have a mouth part adapted for that. A butterfly is a nectar feeding organism, so it has a long proboscis that it can stick down into the flowers and get nectar. And then a fly has mouth parts that are good for lapping up fluids from decomposing stuff. Arthropods were some of the first animals to colonize land, so they probably ar ar uh, arrived on land shortly after the plants before a lot of other things. So their body plan helped them make the transition to land because again, it's so adaptable. The segments, um, the ability to have wings and limbs, um, the specialization of limbs has helped them um, conquer all of the different types of biomes they encountered once they reached land. Okay, so a last note about the arthropods. They go through an elaborate molting process called metamorphosis. Um, so molting is, again, the shedding of their exoskeleton that allows them to get bigger because, remember, that exoskeleton holds them in. They can't grow their body size without losing that. Um, and it also allows them to do something even more interesting, which is to actually go through very different body shapes. Um, during their life cycle. So we'll look at complete metamorphosis. This is the one most people have learned about before. Um, and so this is when there's not just a change in size, but a dramatic change in body form. So the classic is a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. So the caterpillar is a larval stage um, and it looks very different from the adult butterfly and it feeds on different things. And that's one of the nice things about this. The, the babies and the adults don't compete for food. So the caterpillar feeds on leaves. It eventually sheds its skin and then goes into a chrysalis. And while it's in the chrysalis, it's developing and changing and will hatch out of the chrysalis when its body has metamorphosized into the adult form. And then the adult butterfly can then mate and lay eggs and start the whole process over again. So again, a very dramatic 
change in form is what complete metamorphosis is. Now, even if an arthropod is not going to change dramatically in form, it is going to um, still have to molt in order to get bigger. And so this kind of metamorphosis is called incomplete. So a grasshopper is an example of this. And maybe you've noticed this like in May or April, you will see little grasshoppers. And by August or September, you will see really big ones. And the difference is really significant. Like um, as big as your nail in the springtime and as big as your finger by the end of the summer. And that's the same grasshopper. It's gone through its metamorphosis. So they get progressively bigger um, and their smaller stages are called the nymph stages. And then the adult is the, the maximally biggest size. But notice that there's no difference in what they look like. They're just different in size. And so that's incomplete metamorphosis. And again, they have to shed in between these different stages. They have to lose their exoskeleton um, in order to get bigger.